Hello everyone and welcome to episode 16 of the PVM Hub. If you're unfamiliar with the series, these are a set of beginner-friendly revolution guides geared towards teaching the very basics of RuneScape 3 PVM. These guides are by no means optimal, but simply a good place to start on your PVM journey. Today, we'll be looking at the newest of the Elite Dungeons and the Ambassador's Home, the Shadow Reef. Something I'd like to mention before we jump into this is that the Shadow Reef is very difficult to solo. If you want to learn it, I strongly suggest learning in a duo or a trio first. For that reason, I won't be in super low level gear like I normally am to do these, because simply put, I wouldn't be able to complete the dungeon. I will be explaining this as simply as I can, and making sure you know the basics of how to approach every encounter, as well as minimizing my bonuses as much as I can while still completing the dungeon. The Elite Dungeon 3 is an interesting encounter, as the only super high profile drops come from the final boss at the very end. Even the two previous bosses have mediocre drops compared to most bosses in the game. The biggest draws here are the pieces of the Eldritch Crossbow, which are all hovering around 800 mil to 1 billion GP as of recording this video. You will get drops along the way like Shadow Reef Relics and other alchemicals, but nothing that will stand out to you. Similar to ED2, there are three main bosses separated by a series of trash mobs. These mobs can prove to be dangerous, especially if you don't know how to handle them. With this guide, we will mainly focus on the boss mechanics, but I will be walking you through a full run at the end and explaining how to deal with most of the trash mobs you see as you go through. As always, these guides are broken up into a few different sections, those being the recommendations and requirements, setting up your revolution bar, the important facts and mechanics of the fight, and then a full fight breakdown. Looking at requirements, like most high-level bosses for some reason, the Shadow Reef has none. However, you're not going to get very far if you take this on too early. For my recommendations, any combat style is fine here, although Mage is probably the weakest, so avoid that if you can. Melee is more difficult than range, but it's really up to you. I'd suggest 90 combat stats at a minimum if you want to be useful to your team and groups, and 95 to 99 if you're going to try and take this on solo. For herb lore, overloads are going to be super helpful here, so try to get 92 if you can. Otherwise, you can buy some things like the Grand Ranging Potion, the War Master Potion, or the Magic Potion off of the Grand Exchange. For summoning, it will really help you in your early kills if you can get up to a Yak or a Ripper Demon, but seeing as our Yak requires 96 and a Ripper Pouch is 100k each, you can use a War Tortoise if you absolutely have to. Just know it will be far worse than your other options. It will be helpful to have Invention unlocked here, and the standard array of solid perks like Precise, Equilibrium, Crackling, Enhanced Devoted, and so on are solid choices here. If you want some more ideas for optimal perks, you can type in forward slash wiki optimal PVM perks and you'll be taken to a wiki page that is super helpful. For prayer, curses are going to be strongly recommended here, so ideally you have at least 95 for turmoil, anguish, and torment. If you don't have that high of a prayer level, I'd suggest a normal prayer book and using augury, piety, and rigor. In terms of gear and supplies, use the best gear that you can get your hands on. I think the lowest bar if you're going in a group is probably tier 70 armor and tier 85 weapons. Less than that and you'll be having serious issues when it comes to accuracy, which will be extremely detrimental to you in the long run. If you're using overloads, I'd suggest bringing some Ceridoman brews for extra healing, as well as combination of green blubber jellyfish and beltfish. Some other items that could be helpful to you are a sign of life, a salve amulet E, and a shadow reef lucky charm. There are a few other items you'll want while going through the dungeon, but I'll cover these as we get there. Looking at your revolution bar now, I have a few bars on screen that are considered optimal by the PVM Encyclopedia. For most of this dungeon, AoE abilities will be key, so make sure you know which of your abilities can do that. For the final boss, you'll need to be able to use stuns manually for one mechanic, so having at least one of your stuns off of your revolution bar with an easy to reach keybind will be super nice. Of course, I'll come back to talking more about that later when we get to it, but just be ready for that when we get there. We will also be using plenty of defensives throughout the whole dungeon, so make sure you're familiar with abilities like Anticipation, Freedom, Resonance, Devotion, Debilitate, Reflect, and Barricade. I know that sounds like a lot, but these abilities will really become second nature after a bit, and they are super helpful in all types of PVM. Now let's start looking at boss mechanics. We're going to cover the bosses in order, and then we'll go through and talk about the trash mobs in between. The first boss you'll see is the Crassian Leviathan. This boss is very straightforward when broken down, and only has three real mechanics to be aware of. The first, and probably the most important, is that the Crassian has a passive healing mechanic, which will drag this fight down endlessly unless dealt with. You can negate the healing factor by using weapon poison, with the higher tier, the more reduced healing. You can buy weapon poison potions off the Grand Exchange for relatively cheap, so make sure you have some active or in your inventory when you start the fight. 
The second key to this fight is to never stand in the middle of the arena or in front of the Krassian at any point. This is probably the quickest way to die, so make sure you stand along the top wall and to either side of the Leviathan. If you're using melee, you'll need a halberd type weapon or something that can reach more than one square. Otherwise, you'll be forced to stand in front of the Krassian and will more than likely die. If you're looking for a cheap option, you can use the Crystal Halberd here. The only attacking mechanic the Krassian has is a side-to-side -side head swipe which will deal massive typeless damage. You'll see the Krassian draw its head back to one side and then drag it across the ground towards the center and then repeat this motion on the opposite side. You avoid this by leaving the area before the head hits the ground, so feel free to use something like Surge or Bladed Dive to get out earlier. Krassian will use this mechanic twice and then switch sides of the arena. All you need to do is chase it down. You may get stunned in the middle as you're trying to switch sides, so if you're worried about that, you can use Anticipation as you go, or use Freedom after you get stunned. After that, it's rinse and repeat until the Krassian finally goes down. All in all, a very simple boss fight which shouldn't take too long to get the hang of. The next boss you'll encounter is Tarakat the Necromancer. This boss is substantially more challenging than the Krassian, so be ready to struggle a bit here on your first tries. Tarkit attacks with Mage mainly, but will also attack with strong ranged attacks while inside of his own death swiftness. There is a visual cue for this as well as a line of text that pops up over his head, so make sure you're paying attention and be ready to switch your prayers. Let's go over some of his main mechanics. Tarkit has four phases that are gated by HP. In phase 1, the only mechanic that is really impactful is his Rift of Undeath. Tarkit will spawn a portal in the center of the room, which will continually spawn skeletons out of it. There is also a countdown bar attached to this portal, and if it reaches zero, it will explode and do massive damage. When this portal is active, make sure you kill it immediately. You can use Devotion and allow your AoEs to clear out the weak skeletons it spawns, which will serve both as a clearing method and will extend your Devotion uptime for each skeleton killed. Once you've dealt enough damage, at 200k HP, Tarakit will fly away to either the east or west and spawn a large zombie. If you're new to this boss, I strongly recommend killing them, but if you're confident in DPS and your ability to tank, you can choose to ignore them. I would not advise that to start, however. The zombie spawned depends on which side of the arena Tarakit flies to, and it will always be the same. If Tarakit is closer to the west, he will spawn a corpse carrier, and if he is farther east, he will spawn a bloated monstrosity. Of the two, the corpse carrier is far more dangerous, and in my opinion should be dealt with first. The Corpse Carrier will attack with melee and constantly spawn additional skeletons to reinforce. Devotion will be great here to negate all damage of one type to one, and it will get its time extended with each kill. The Bloated Monstrosity will attack with heavy melee attacks and can be dealt with rather easily, all things considered, by just DPSing it down. After spawning its zombie, Tarakit will heal back up to full and you will repeat the same set of mechanics as in Phase 1. Deal with portals whenever they go up, and make sure to switch from Protect from Range if Tarakit ever enters a Death Swiftness. Once both zombies have been spawned, Tarakit will move on to Phase 4. The only thing new in Phase 4 is that Tarakit will spawn a wall of ghosts that will move towards you or a teammate in a straight line. The best way to handle this is to surge through it, but if you don't feel confident or comfortable with that, you can simply run backwards and walk around. Each time he uses this mechanic, there will be two sets of ghosts, so be prepared for that. If you start to get overwhelmed at any point by the skeletons, feel free to get off of Tarakat and take care of them. Most of the difficulty in this fight comes from the amount of damage the adds can do and from being overwhelmed. If you can, take your time to clear out the mechanics fully so that you don't get rushed down by mobs. It should be noted that Tarakat can sacrifice a large number of his skeletons to heal, but honestly we don't care about that too much. Less skeletons means less damage we need to worry about, and we can just continue to hit Tarakat and make up for that healed damage. If you have the Salve Amulet E, it will increase your accuracy and damage against Tarakit by 20% each, so it's a great upgrade and a very easy best in slot here. With that, it takes us to the final boss of ED3, and the biggest challenge here by far. I know I normally like to make things look easy, but the Ambassador is a difficult boss fight, especially solo. There are a few sections that are going to be gated by DPS, so it's important to know a few optimizations and rotations here and there. The Ambassador attacks mainly with range, but can attack with melee and mage once every 5 auto attacks. The mage and melee attacks will hit much harder, and if you can manage to count auto attacks, it will be a great time to use resonance if you're comfortable with that. The only time you will see the Ambassador melee attack, however, is if you are fighting him in melee distance. Otherwise, he will always attack you with range or mage. 
It's also a nice tip here that the ambassador will always start with either a mage or melee attack, so make sure your starting prayer is mage or melee, and then switch after the first attack. The first mechanic you will see starting the fight is what we will call smoke. You'll see a bar placed above your head that is counting down. Once this bar reaches zero, two square clouds of smoke will be dropped at your location, one tick after the other. These gas clouds will stay there for an entire rotation and will deal high typeless damage to anyone who walks into them. It's important to be cognizant of where you place them for reasons we'll see in a moment, but when you're starting, I would suggest just running to the back wall and getting them as far out of the way as possible, especially in groups. If you're doing melee, the pro strat is to drop them right next to the ambassador and melee distance and continue DPSing from the other side. This does leave a lot of room for error, however, and I would only recommend it if you're confident in your abilities. Shortly after the smoke, the ambassador will spawn unstable black holes around the arena, one for each player in the fight. You'll need to make your way to one of these black holes and use a stun in it to destroy it. If you're in a team, this requires some communication, because if not all the black holes get destroyed, you'll be bombed for high typeless damage. This is why I suggested having a stun off of your revolution bar, so that you always have it available when the black holes spawn. A small optimization here is after stunning the black hole, the timing works out almost perfectly for the ambassador to be using their boosted auto attack. So as you make your way back to combat with him, you can use resonance and get a free 4k heal. If you don't feel confident with that, just change your prayer and eat up. Shortly after the black holes, you'll get another smoke. Make sure you position it safely and make your way back to the southeast of the arena. The ambassador will turn his back and shoot out six fragments followed by very scary looking laser beams known as spinners. Your goal for this section is to kill as many fragments as you can in the time allowed. If you have curses and soul split, you can use that here to gain back a large amount of HP. Getting spinners down is a top priority, so feel free to use thresholds and ultimates as you see fit. You will have time to do one full lap around the arena, and any fragments you don't kill will be absorbed by the ambassador, and he will charge as many nukes equal to the amount of fragments absorbed. For example, if he absorbs three fragments, he will nuke three times. I would suggest if he absorbs three or more fragments to teleport out, as it gets very difficult to tank the more there are. There are a few different ways to deal with the nukes, and you can tell when they're coming by watching the bar above a bastard's head tick down. The best way to handle one nuke is to use resonance after being hit by a single ambassador auto attack, and then you can safely shield swap and use rezo. If you have more than one, you can use debilitate and reflect after resonancing the first one, and you will take 75% reduced damage on up to two more. If you're really panicking, you can choose to use Barricade here as well, but I don't recommend it as it cripples your adrenaline for the next phase. You will repeat this cycle from the beginning until Ambassador gets down to 600k HP. Phase 2 starts at 600k and mechanically is the easiest part of this whole fight. The Ambassador will start calling in Crassian minions, which will attack you with range. You can use defensives here like Devotion to reduce all of that damage down to zero, or Reflect if you want to negate it by half. The only thing you need to worry about here is staying alive and bringing Ambassador down to 400k HP. Once you reach that threshold, Saryu will come healing you to full and killing all of the minions. For that reason, it's most optimal to keep your health low so that you get the most out of the heal, but this is a minor optimization, so if that's too scary for the moment, don't worry about it. After that, you'll be on to the third and final phase of this fight. The Ambassador will spawn shadow hands around the arena and heal up slightly. There are two things to worry about in this phase. The first, and the easier thing, is that the hands will slap the ground and send white energies towards the ambassador. Each one of these will heal him for 2500 HP, and you can stop them from healing him by positioning yourself in between them. The number of hands healing him at any given time is equal to the amount of people in your group. Blocking this healing will make the final phase much shorter, as each time you block, you're blocking 7500 healing. The second mechanic, and the most deadly, is when the ambassador will call out a group member's name and focus on them, shooting five high damaging magic attacks out in very quick succession. The best way to handle this is to switch to Mage Prayer and instantly use Devotion. This will block all of the damage and allow you to keep attacking. Just make sure to change your prayer back to range afterwards. This attack happens once every 30 seconds, and he chooses someone at random each time, so if you're soloing or get called twice in a row, you won't have Devotion off of cooldown. For the second attack, you will need to rely on Debilitate, Reflect, and Rage Prayer, as well as constantly eating. Even through Debilitate and Reflect, you will still take a lot of damage, so make sure you're careful with your health. If you don't feel like you can tank it, you can choose to use Barricade instead, but it will reduce your DPS by quite a bit. Repeat this over and over until the boss reaches 0 HP, 
and then you have gotten your very first ambassador kill. Before we jump into a full run through, let's touch quick on the bestiary of trash mobs you'll see going through the dungeon. First and foremost are the Crassians. These guys are most prevalent in the first section of the dungeon, and have three different types. Warriors, Scuttlers, and Scouts. Warriors and Scuttlers will both attack with melee, and Scouts with range. They're pretty easy to deal with, especially with AoE, but can do surprisingly high damage if you aren't paying attention. We'll follow that up with your typical zombie or undead, which will always come in large clumps and do melee damage. Very often, they are nothing to worry about, but just be careful not to get overrun. Next is the Cloaked Zealot. These guys will attack with Mage and spawn in extra Crassians to help them whenever they aggro on you. It's best to deal with them quickly so you don't get too many extra mobs put onto you. The Necromancer does the same thing, just with Skeletons and Zombies instead of Crassians. Same concept. Sea Horrors are next, and you'll only run into two of these guys throughout the whole dungeon, and they're both in the same spot. They have a special attack which will do high typeless damage, and can be very scary. Try to DPS these guys down ASAP for your best chance at survival. Their normal attacks are melee based and are, all in all, not too scary. You'll run into a single Calgarian demon that is required in this run through. They have a few special attacks, but honestly nothing to worry about considering you've already cleared this far. Pray melee or soul split and take them down. And lastly, we have the Warped Skeleton. These guys can attack with mage and melee and do a ton of damage. They can also heal themselves for some of the damage they do and are just generally a pain. They are priority number one towards the end of the dungeon, and I'd suggest camping protect from magic against them. Starting our full run through, you can see that I'm wearing full masterwork and a scythe. You definitely don't need this, and its intention was just to get me through this faster and for the viewers, as this section will take me about 15 minutes to get through, even when sped up completely. For the first two sections, you need to clear every mob that you see. All the Crassians are needed to be killed before the Iberia unlocks. Once you get to the Cloak Zealots, you only need to take them out for the barrier to unlock, and you can ignore the rest. Once you head down to this group of four, kill the cloaked zealots plus the Crassian scouts to unlock the next barrier, and head on to the zombies. At the zombies, you'll need to kill every zombie in this section, so make sure you have soul split or protect from melee up to try and reduce the damage that you take. Once every zombie is dead, you can head down to the plank and move on to the next section with more zombies and an armored skeleton. Take them out and then move on to the last section before the Crassian leviathan, where you just need to kill these two cloaked zealots to get out of the phase. As soon as this is done, you can teleport out, re-gear, and then teleport back into the fight. For this fight, you can see that I'm wearing full bandos plus a fire cape, as well as a crystal halberd. I get ready for the fight by moving in, I turn on soul split, and I berserk, and then barge into the face of the Crassian Leviathan. You can see this was a bad idea, as I instantly take 9.8k damage and sign immediately. I try and recover this by soul splitting back up, but you'll see in just a second I get hit by the first hit of the head shake and die immediately. This is to show you that even if you know what you're doing, you can still make mistakes and die very quickly at these bosses, but that's all just part of learning. Once we re-gear and come back, you can see that I've learned from these mistakes, I turn on soul split and I berserk on the right hand side, not barging in and not getting in front of him. I do the best I can in my berserk using strong abilities and trying to get up to my thresholds, and I want to be ready for the time when the first head shake comes so that I don't get hit by it. You can see I'm a little bit panicked and I walk into the first hit of it, but I'm just fine after that and I recover. I wait for it to finish and I move off to the left hand side to continue my DPS. If you can dodge that, you've pretty much got the whole Crassian fight down. Just make sure that your prayer stays up, your overload stays active, and your poison stays active. As if you don't have weapon poison, the Crassian will heal for an absurd amount and you will not be able to kill him. After this first rotation, I'm going to speed this up times 5, as the whole fight's going to take me a long time in Bandos with a Crystal Halberd, but I wanted to put it all in here to show you that it is possible, even with this gear. After one more auto attack, the Crassian will recede back into the ship and then head over to the opposite side of the arena, so all we'll want to do is use Anticipation, surge across the arena, and get ready to meet him on the other side, while staying out of the middle. Here we'll speed it up, and really it's just a DPS check the entire way through. The more damage you can deal, the less amount of time this will take. It's as simple as that. Feel free to skip ahead for about 30 to 40 seconds to get to the next part of the video.
if you're still watching at this point, first off, why? Um, but second off, leave your favorite pizza topping in the comments so people don't know what you're talking about. And just like that, we can see that even with the Crystal Halberd and Bandos, we managed to finish off the Crassian without any food. Now we'll teleport out, re-gear, and head back down this way. We can skip all the first guys and just head down to the Cloaked Zealots and the Crassian Scuttlers. Once they're dead, you'd move on to the zombies over here, which are pretty easy to take out, Arcane, Quake, or anything else you have if you're on a different combat style. Jump down this ledge and move on to the Necromancer and the two large skeletons, and then once you head to the right here, take out this Necromancer as well, before moving up to the three large zombies at the end here. This section can be really hard for people. You'll need to activate two Blackstone Relics on either side of the arena, which are guarded by Necromancers. There's a lot of trash mobs here, which deal a lot of damage. You can make sure to put on Protect from Melee and Devotion if you need it. Once you get to this bridge, it's currently bugged, but normally this is a death bridge. You'll be attacked by a ton of ranged skeletons, which will deal an absurd amount of damage if you're not using devotion and protect from range. Make sure you are chugging your food here, and kill the necromancer plus the two sea horrors to move through. There's a cool little surge you can do here, which will skip a bunch of minions, and if you don't do that, you might be in for a world of hurt towards the end. Clear this last section, and move on to Taraket. You can see for Tarakid I'm still in my good gear here, as I was having a lot of trouble recording a kill with full bandos. I would really recommend only using full bandos in tier 70s if you're in a group. If you're any higher than that, you're going to really struggle to deal enough damage before you die. For the most part, this boss is very easy, it just requires a lot of management of minions and a lot of health. If you're good at defensives, you could do this fight pretty easily, but if you're not, you're going to struggle quite a bit. You can see at the beginning I kick Tarakat one step to the west so that I can spawn the Corpse Carrier first instead of the Bloated Monstrosity. This is important because I think it's a lot easier to deal with the Corpse Carrier earlier into the fight when you're dealing with less mechanics than it is to fight it towards the end. You can choose to do whatever you want, and if you leave it up to choice, I'm pretty sure he spawns the Bloated Monstrosity every time. You can see for the first portal I kill it rather easily, and I try to kick him back towards the middle so that I can hit him with my AoEs whenever I'm killing the portal. I'm using Devotion whenever he starts attacking me with range, and I'm using and I'm using my AoEs to extend the uptime whenever I can. Here with the next portal, I speed it up a little bit and I manage to get him down to phase health. You can see the corpse carrier spawns, and I try to focus on that immediately. I throw as many thresholds into it as I can in hopes to DPS it very quickly. I'm doing this because the longer he's up, the more skeletons he's going to spawn, which means the more damage I'm going to need to deal with. If you're confident in prayer flicks here, you can prayer flick between the mage hit that Tarkit does, the melee attack that the, the corpse carrier does, and the range attack that the skeletons do. I choose to just flick between mage and range, and I use devotion to try and block the damage as much as possible. You can see that Tarkit absorbs a bunch of the skeletons in for health there, but honestly that's more helpful to me than it is to him because I know I'll be able to deal damage to him, but those skeletons were a lot more of a nuisance than he gave them credit for. I take out the corpse carrier just as the portal spawns, and I go to finish that up as soon as possible. I continue to use devotion whenever I can to negate damage, and I'm making sure my health stays high so I don't make any mistakes. I continue to DPS here, and it's all about just killing the portal when it's up, and trying to hit Tarkat with as many abilities as I can, and using devotion at solid times. Once he gets down to phase HP, he's going to move off to the left hand side and spawn the bloated monstrosity. You can see he would have moved off to the left, but I was blocking him, which is a cute little quirk that happens in this boss fight, which is kind of funny. It's not a big deal, but if you're comfortable with it, you can get some heals from Soul Split by blocking him. The rift spawns and I go to focus that instead of the bloated monstrosity, as it's time gated and much more important. If I don't kill it in time, it will deal a lot more damage to me than, than the bloated monstrosity ever will. Once it goes down, I choose to focus Tarkat for a second, which in hindsight is a mistake. Once I kill the bloated monstrosity, I'll never have to deal with it again, and I would be able to deal with this phase with a lot less damage. So instead I switch my focus back to it, and I take it down pretty easily. 
Once both zombies are down, this fight becomes immensely easier, as the only thing you'll need to deal with are these rifts that spawn every so often, and now he'll start to throw ghosts at you every 45 seconds or so. You can see we get ready for the first set of ghosts here, and we click through it no problem. We do actually get hit by that one as we weren't quite fast enough, you can tell by the melee attack splat that hit us, but it only did about 2000 damage, so it means we're totally fine. The second one I dodged through without a problem, and I continue to focus down the portal as soon as he spawns it. This fight at this point is just rinse and repeat, where we'll be dodging the ghosts whenever he throws them at us, making sure our protection prayers are correct, and killing every rift of undeath that pops up on our screen. If you get to this point, I have no questions that you'll be able to finish the boss fight without problems. With this last rift that he spawns, I choose to not focus it at all because I know I can kill Tarket before it goes off, and if I do, the portal will just despawn. This way I can kill Tarket, not worry about it, and then teleport out and re-gear for the next section. This first section after Tarket can deal a surprising amount of magic damage, so if you're not comfortable, make sure you're praying that instead of soul split. After you take them out, there is a single Calgarian demon you'll need to kill before skipping the rest of this area. After this you'll head to this necromancer here and take him out, and then you'll get over to this one in the corner and take them out as well. You'll have two more necromancers that you need to take out, this one in the middle of the arches, and this one in the last barrier. You can jump down here, and then hug the left wall as to not aggro anything extra, and then group all of these Crassians together and kill them with AoEs. This next section will have two warped skeletons, and I strongly suggest you deal with them individually instead of together. You can deal a lot of damage with AoEs, but they can also deal a lot of damage back to you, and your chances are better one-on-one -on -one than they are two-on-one. -on -one. This next section will also have two warped skeletons, but I'd suggest focusing the group first as there are a bunch of trash mobs that also need to be killed for the barrier to go down. In this last section, there is an additional two warp skeletons, which I again suggest taking on one by one, because if you don't, they can deal a lot of damage to you and you can surprisingly die at very inopportune times. Getting ready for the ambassador, I strongly suggest putting on protect from mage first and then devotioning while out of combat so that it doesn't take adrenaline. If you use a defensive ability while not in combat, it will take you zero adrenaline, even if it's the threshold. I barge in, and then once the magic attack hits me, I use protect from range to switch and deal with his auto attacks. I get ready for the first smoke, and I'm going to drop this one in melee distance like I suggested for the pro strats guide. It's really not that difficult to get a hang of, but if you're not comfortable with clips, clicks, I would not suggest doing this. I drop that on his lower right quadrant, and then I move over to the lower left side. He spawns his first wormhole, and I move over to stun it, and then I wait for a second for the blue magic attack, and I resonance that, and walk back in. This heals me for 5.2 thousand so that I don't need to waste food in this fight. I continue to use my thresholds and DPS as much as I can, and he'll throw one more smoke on me before going into spinners. I use escape at the last moment to place this out of range of deep out of range of melee distance so that I won't need to worry about it again. I get a few more abilities on him, and then he will turn around and go into spinners. You can see I'm really low health here, but I can soul split for this entire next phase and get that back up. I choose to use Berserk, then I use a lot of basic abilities on these on these first two spinners. Your Berserk should enhance your damage enough where you can take them down without having to use any thresholds. If you can, I'd use basic abilities on the first and second spinner, and then thresholds on the third and fourth, and then whatever you have left on the fifth. It's very unlikely that you'll ever get a run where you take out all six. Keep moving around in the circle and dodging the laser beams, and I strongly suggest Weapon Poison here to help finish stuff off. I managed to get this last one over here, but unfortunately the one right before it managed to live at 46 HP even after I tried to go back and get it. That means I'll need to deal with two fragments for this fight, which means two explosions here. For the first one, I turn on protect from range, I see the first auto attack hit me, and then I use resonance to block all of the damage. 
After that, once I see him charging up the second one, I use Debilitate and Reflect, and I tank this one for 2.3 thousand damage. You can use a Power Burst of Vitality here to make it even safer for yourself, but I was confident enough in my abilities to tank that that I didn't need. I drop the next smoke in his lower left quadrant, and I move up to the north where I can deal with him better. I stun the next wormhole, and I blade a dive back in front of him. The boss phase is at 550,000 HP, so if you can't get him down to that, you're going to have to deal with the second set of spinners, which is what's going to happen here. I don't get him down far enough, so I have to do another set of spinners, which is no harm to me. I use my soul split, berserk, and I move around and try and kill as many as I can. Again, I focus on basics for the first two, thresholds on the second two, and then whatever I have left for the last one. I almost never go for the full six, because in my experience, I've never gotten it. If there's an easy way, make sure to let me know in the comments. I get back in front of the ambassador where I can do my most damage, and then I make sure to resonance the first one as there's only one hit me, only one hitting me. I DPS down to 550,000 HP, and then we'll move on to phase two. Once phase 2 starts, there will be a bunch of minions to spawn all over the place. I would suggest using Devotion early so that you have it back on cooldown for phase 3, but Devotion can save you from a lot of damage in this phase, so I'd really recommend using it, especially if your DPS isn't great. Seryu will come and heal you back up to full HP once you, once you DPS Ambassador down to 400,000 HP, so you can hang around low HP if you feel confident, but I wouldn't suggest it if you're learning, especially because random melee auto attacks or random mage auto attacks can wipe you out pretty quickly. You see I receive the heal here, and moments later Seryu will take out all of the minions and I'll be moved on into phase 3, which is the final phase in this fight. You can see the ambassador spawns hands around, and I'm making sure that I have enough adrenaline to use devotion when I need it. I was fortunate enough to be standing in front of the first hand when it, spot, or when it started to heal him, and I, I'm also in front of the second hand. I make sure to focus on calmly moving around the boss at this point, and I keep my health high as to not make any mistakes. The only thing I'm looking for here is when he calls my name, that I'll switch to protect from mage and use devotion to block everything. Since I'm doing this solo, my name will be called again, and I will not have devotion off of cooldown. This means for the second time he calls my name, I'll need to use Debilitate, Reflect, and Pray Mage. I'm mentally getting ready to do that at this point, and making sure I know where everything is, and what buttons I need to press to activate that. This attack happens every 30 seconds, so if you have cooldown timers on your abilities, you know that Devotion has a 60 second cooldown, which means when its cooldown is halfway done, you will see the next attack. Here it comes, and I do Debilitate, Reflect, and Protect from Mage, and I eat constantly while going through that. Each one will still deal around 900 damage to you, which all in all is around 4,500 damage that you'll still be taking through all of those defensives. I continue to move around and keep my health high as to not get cheesed out by any random special attack. I'm blocking as much healing as I can while moving around, and I'm letting Revolution do most of the work. I'm not manually activating pretty much anything, and I'm focusing mostly on staying alive. As this next attack comes in, I turn on Protect from Mage and use Devotion again, and I repeat the process. I continue moving around and blocking healing, and I just continue to keep DPSing and using my thresholds whenever I feel confident enough to do so. The most important thing here is not dying and making sure you are ready for the name call every time it comes around. For the last name call, I didn't feel confident using Debilitate, Reflect, and Protect from Mage because my health was rather low. Instead, I put on my shield and used Barricade to make sure I stayed safe. Once that attack is over, I re-equip my offhand attacking weapon, and I continue DPSing the boss. I'm trying to keep my health very high here as to not get cheesed, and I don't want to lose this kill. I keep rotating around and making sure he doesn't get healed, and just like that, the ambassador goes down. You can see that I only used about 3 quarters of my food, and I still had a decent amount of supplies left if I wanted to keep going. I really hope you found this guide helpful, and if you end up getting your first kills because of it, I would love to hear about it. If you'd like to start trying ED3 but don't have a group, come join the Discord. I would love to take anyone, and I've already cleared three completely new players through it, and I'm sure I can help you too. I'll leave a link to that in the description, as well as in the comments. If this guide helped you, please consider giving it a like, and if you like more than one of my videos, please consider subscribing. 
Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Ziggy out.